Record. Mic trigger. Button. Hey folks, the history of metal, part one. So, in the 1960s, uh, in the late 60s, when surf rock was kind of kicking off, um, and also, there was also the beatnik generation, you know, William S. Burroughs and Brian Geisen, kind of talked about heavy metal in their book. Also, there had been the film, The Wild One, which was um, a film that was never really... It came out, but it was banned in a lot of places due to the uh, violent nature of the film. So... Um, during the 60s, we had the hippie era, the hippie era, but also you had the beatnik era. Um, also you had, um, you know, the 60s was a time, the late 60s was a time, a very dark time where we had um, Helter Skelter, which was by the Beatles, you could say. That was sort of a metal song, the way um, Paul McCartney's raunching rock vocals kind of go from sawdust to a sort of gr gritty uh, metal vocal style in that voice. Um, there was also... Uh, people like Captain Beefheart and uh, Frank Zappa. Now, this wasn't metal as yet because um, Frank Zappa was kind of, you know, these groups were using distortion. Um, you know, it wasn't until we got some garage rock bands in the late 60s that decided to use um, distorted sound. And um, a lot of rock bands that became metal or introduced the metal sound or the heavy sound um, really only made a very few heavy songs in the catalog or one or two heavy songs in their catalog. Uh, the Kinks being a prime example, they only ever made two songs. Uh, Ray Davis just wanted the uh, distorted sound of the guitar and because there was no effects pedals around in the day he sliced the speaker cone with the razor blade also Pete Townsend from The Who was also um, coined for doing this type of sound however um, it wasn't made known until later on they did it but Ray Davis was the first to do it um, was to take that speaker cone and uh, slice it and a lot of people then started to follow suit another band was called uh, Iron Butterfly a sort of um, a post psychedelic rock, uh, progressive rock band Really what prog rock should have been um, because it was kind of moving forward and Iron Butterfly did that. But they only ever made very few um, heavy songs. Avogada La Viva is one of those songs. But really they kind of used heavy structure instead of heavy lyrics. Um, so it wasn't until we got to the very early 70s with uh, bands like Zeppelin. But before I get to that, I want to take you right back, way before the 60s, 
to the 30s, the 1930s, where we had the blues and um, some slave music and Eastern blues and um, some of the sad chord progressions or whatever you get from that. Um, you hear it in, you know, some early Led Zeppelin numbers. Uh, Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You is one of those numbers. The way that the guitar sort of weeps, has that sort of gentle moan, comes from the Eastern Blues. Now, a lot of the Eastern Blues, these people had no guitars, and um, there was a very melancholic side to the blues. When people think of the blues, they think of the... Um, bubblegum, cheesy commercial side of it. Um, but unfortunately, the blues has a very uh, melancholic root. Um, it goes from dark gospel and all of that sort of stuff. And there was one band that uh, really pushed the blues uh, to this root, and that was a band called Edgar Freya. And uh, they really, really pushed this. Um, because there were, you know, there was, uh, Howl and Wolf and Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters giving you a sort of a sweet, gentle side, more a bit like Ray Charles. And Howl and Wolf giving you that sort of real dark side, you know, real sort of growly type. I wouldn't say dark, but kind of growly. Um, but the actual sort of melancholic dark side came from the, uh, came from the church, it came from the fields, it came from the prisons, it came from the slave movements, it came from real harsh conditions where people were being treated, uh, not so nicely. My trigger, my lock button is on, double... And so, so they could do that. They, um, literally, they went and, uh, sung what they, sung what they felt. Uh, it was a real, um, it was a real, you know, they amplified, you know, this is before punk even, uh, they amplified their stresses. And some people got their freedom. Uh, you could say some people did get their freedom. You know, but... Some people didn't. And it's still going on today where... People are singing for... Their rights. Because they know that... Um, you know, you can take away a lot of materialistic things from people, but... You can't take songs away from people, you know. And then you had, uh, you know, dark folk as well. You had people writing songs like Needle of Death and uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I kind of wanted to leave folk out of this because, again, when people think of folk, they think of um, sort of... you know, nice songs about roaming through the countryside, you know, kind of Joni Mitchell type, that sort of stuff, you know, Bob Dylan, you know, when you think of folk, you think of that, you don't think of the other stuff, and there's a lot of uh, things in folk which are quite, you know, listenable, um... And some of those things got into the metal movement. Um, also, you know, the Beatles sound got into the metal genre. Because, you know, Black Sabbath. If you hear uh, interviews with Ozzy, he really wanted to sound like the Beatles. Um, 
and yeah kind of the dark side of the Beatles so getting to more of metal then um, so basically you know you had all of that the first group to do sort of the hard rock sound was Led Zeppelin but they weren't hard rock they were kind of big rock um, but they kind of widen their sound uh, Jimmy Page's guitar sound isn't really big it's scratchy probably big for its time um, but you've got to remember how they recorded things you've got to remember what they did if you listen to the first two Led Zeppelin albums you know what I mean um, we didn't really get the big Led Zepp sound as it would be till um, Led Zepp 4 and Houses of the Holy and yeah th that's when we saw the big Zepp sound really but the early Zeppelin sound really wasn't big at all uh, it was very new for its time but wasn't big um, that's what you have to remember but I think you know Jimmy Page used a lot of reverb but he, you know he kind of it was the way he he played that guitar and um, his soul went into into a lot of his playing there's a couple of really good interviews which aren't around now on YouTube but there's one specific one where he said that um, he wanted to move on what the Yardbirds were doing because the Yardbirds were sort of holding back, you know? They kind of wanted to go more... I mean, it's not like they didn't want to go poppy, but they kind of wanted to edge away from what, what you were hearing in the 60s. Which, um, I mean, even if you listen to the art, the Yardbirds, you can tell Jimmy Page was always trying to move the band further. So this goes into the whole prog rock thing. You know, prog rock trying to move forward, but really a lot of prog rock was going backward a lot of the time. Um, hence why it fell into pop. Um, and it was probably misunderstood in the beginning. If you want misunderstood, you know, you have bands like Emerson, Lake and Palmer, which really did go misunderstood, um, you know, but it's later on they decided that, you know, they went more sort of down the pop route when really they didn't. So anyway, I'm steering away from prog rock because that's for another day, but prog rock's important. Um, psychedelic pop is important because without you know psychedelic pop there was a psychedelic rock band called Grand Funk Railroad um, who also inspired metal not just by the sound but by the energy that that band had you know um, and that's why you get the energy for metal music so now I've sort of covered oh yeah and uh, Edgar Freya which I mentioned before which kind of made they were a blues rock band but they kind of went a bit more heavier now before I carry on I want to get the satanic crap out the way um, you know Alistair Crowley people were kind of um, there were books which were published about Alistair Crowley's following um, but there were loads of these satanic books there wasn't just Alistair Crowley there was loads of these things happening around and uh, you know Timothy Leary trying to carry the whole thing on but yeah Alistair Crowley was the big man he was the he was a rock star himself and um, William S. Burroughs you know who I mentioned before he was another rock star but Alistair Crowley was 
he was a rock star before even rock stars were even thought of. Um, you know, he was in that culture, I guess. But, you know, there's lots of other people that are in that. But, yeah, I mean, there was all that kind of stuff going on. You know, all that wishy-washy... Um, witchery stuff and I mentioned Charles Manson but there's um, another cult which you should look on and it's based on uh, Jim Jones look him up um, the people's temple and um, so yeah there were these sick people which inspired the music of the time there was some sick things happening in the late 60s which didn't kill off the hippie movement um, but it killed off the hippie dream Mike Trigger, Mike Lock, finish recording